Normally, demystifying science is focused on what I would call esoteric questions. The questions of the atom, the questions of ancient geologic history, about whether or not cells have will. And I myself find that I'm focused on very concrete questions when I'm away from the podcast. How are we going to get food? How are we going to pay for gas? How is the world that we live in, that we participate in, that our children are growing up in, what will that world look like 15, 20, 100 years down the line? And one of the main things that I circle around all the time is food. What will the food of the future look like? What are these massive structures that provide food for us? How will they change over time? What is working? What is not working? And so to have that conversation on the show, we have Tamar Haspel, who's a columnist who just wrote a book called To Boldly Grow, which occupies itself with these questions. And the premise of the book is an experiment. Is it possible to live for a year and eat something that you have grown or killed every single day? And it seems like the answer is Yes, with an asterisk. Because it's difficult, and it is time-consuming, and it is not necessarily the full solution to the world's problems. It's certainly not the solution to the world's problems. And, you know, it's funny because people associate the, um, you know, getting your own food um, with usually a a lifestyle or a worldview, and maybe it's the crunchy granola opt out of, you know, in, in the industrialized food system worldview, or maybe it's the, you know, prepper hedge against Armageddon f- worldview. But it's actually just something that humans did for our entire existence until, you know, in evolutionary time, you know, last Thursday, when all of a sudden we have this modern food system that can feed us. And I didn't do it to find a solution to food. I did it, you know, sounds so stupid to say, I did it because it was there. I did it because my husband and I had moved out of Manhattan and we had these two acres on Cape Cod. And I looked around and said, okay, well, I'm a food writer by profession. What can I do here that I couldn't do in New York? And the answer was all kinds of things. And so we started doing it not to answer big questions, not to solve big problems, but because it seemed like a constructive use of our time. And, and it was interesting. And, but what came out of it surprised the hell out of me because it ended up being this compelling thing that, that did answer some questions, but not the ones I was expecting not really the ones about food, although I learned a lot about food um, and we can definitely talk about that. But the biggest thing that came out of it was actually probably not on, on your radar here on demystifying science, but it was like the secret to self-improvement, <laughs> which is that, okay, I spend so much time trying to get better at the things like the things I do for a living, the things that are, you know, serious and important in my life, trying to answer some of these hard questions. But it turned out that trying something you've never done before for the first time, that's where the, that's where the learning curve is the steepest. Mm. That's, you learn most during, in that first iteration of whatever you do, because you've never done it before. And every iteration after that, you'll learn a little less. So if if you like being on the steep part of the learning curve, and and I do, um, the secret is just to go out and try new things all the time. But I think that there is a link to to the bigger questions about about food and how we feed people and how we can feed people well. Because although the modern food system um, has definitely taken food insecurity off the table for a lot of people, not everyone, um, it has meant that you guys and I am free to do other things for a living. You know, there would be no dental hygienists if everybody had to get their own food. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And so it allows us to, to think or to write or to practice law for a living, but it has also been responsible um, for poor health, obesity. And, and I think if we're talking about going forward and how we feed people, those are pressing problems. And in some ways, getting your hands dirty and reacquainting yourself with, with plants and animals that are the foods that humans thrive on can be something of an antidote to that. And that was a wickedly long answer. <laughs> what is it in particular that you think that can be, I know this is going to be hard to boil down, but like that you think you can learn from growing your own food about the choices that you're making at the grocery store. Like if the, re if the, if we're coming back with like obesity and there's these health dilemmas resulting from the fact that we have more calories available than in the, you know, millions of years. Sometimes I hold a jar of, we buy these peanuts. It's like two and a half pounds of peanuts for $6. And sometimes I hold the container and I just marvel at the calories that are contained within it. I'm like, this would have taken a year, you know, six months of foraging. <laughs> Right, exactly. And it's, and so it's funny that you asked that question, because, you know, my stock in trade is analysis, I write this column for the Washington Post, and my job is to try and get to the bottom of difficult scientific issues. And it's my job to understand these things. But the power of getting your hands dirty isn't really intellectual, it's visceral. And so, I, I, M Michael, you said that you you have hunted, you have gotten some of your own food, yes? We're just, all right, so we, we just moved out into the country. We were living in a big metropolis and uh, uh -huh. we got the tools of the trade. We have not caught anything. We've been fishing, <laughs> we've been target shooting, <laughs> we have been stomping around in the forest. We've seen a lot of turkeys, actually, but uh, we haven't eaten one of them yet. But so, yeah, we're just beginning this journey. So th this is obviously very uh, real to my mushrooms. world. Oh, we have gotten some delicious and mushrooms. That's true. And huckleberries. Okay. So we've done a little bit. Yeah, sorry. Too long of an so answer. Let me ask you. Let me ask you. So the mushrooms and the huckleberries, when you brought them home and you turned them into something to eat, did that food feel different to you from other food? Of course, food yeah. You buy. And, you know, I ask everybody this, and everybody says, of course, because it does. So then the, the question is, okay, well, what is it? But it's wild how, like, food can taste, like, if I eat just a peanut butter jelly sandwich in the woods, it tastes different than if I eat it in my kitchen. It does. Right? So there's so many things more, like, the experience of, eat, of consume, of, like, Eating is so amazing. We're really, literally physically building our bodies while we do it. And it's this transcendent experience, really. It becomes so mundane when you're just like in a drive through or something. But it's like, it's it really puts it in focus Like when you stop to pay attention to what's actually happening. I wonder if that's what, what we're getting at is well, just... There's, there's a million things that go into enjoying food. And I've never enraged as many people as when I wrote about an egg, a blind egg tasting where we concluded that all eggs taste the same. And we pitted my backyard happy chicken eggs against the, you know, evil supermarket eggs and the fancy pants organic eggs. And we literally wore blindfolds because there can be differences in color and nobody could tell the difference. Uh, you know, the, the comments were all over the map. And people were enraged and they said, <laughs> well, you know, you guys, <laughs> taste buds were shot off in the war, as my mother used to say. I can tell the difference. But of course, none of these people had actually done a blind taste test. They've only seen that their egg is a different color. They know it comes from the chickens in their backyard. So, of course, it's going to taste better because there are so many other associations going on. And I don't mean to minimize those. I think they're super important. Mm -hmm. I also enjoy eating the eggs from I can see my chickens <laughs> right now. And... um. And so, yes, food is all of these other things. And I think... Besides that, taste. Besides right, taste. Besides, and Yeah, besides yeah. the physical composition, there's like something more to this. And, and that's why I think eating better isn't a job for analysis. 
because everybody knows you're supposed to be eat, you know, wholeish foods. You're supposed to eat vegetables. You're not supposed to eat crap. And people know what that is. Um, and and the question is like, how do people convince themselves to eat the things that they know that they should be eating when of course we're surrounded by this temptation all the time. Mm. And so you're not going to grow a candy bar in your backyard, something like that. Right. And so, so, uh, you know, how basically, how are we battling, how can people, individuals battle the excesses of a modern food system, which has many pluses, but also these minuses and you just can't think your way out of it because you can know till the cows come home that you shouldn't be eating the Snickers bar in the middle of the afternoon, but the Snickers bar is there and it's the middle of the afternoon <laughs> and God damn it. <laughs> and so, so, so. It's but if you uh, like grew some cucumbers, just you would, you might be, you might have a new appreciation for them all of a sudden. You might just be fascinated. And, no, and, yeah. No? It's not that easy. And, okay. and so I, I think it's a lot more subtle than that, that, that if you spend time outside and you reconnect with plants and animals, you get close to them, you bring home food that you grow or you hunt or you forage. I think that subtly your perception of, and I am just, there's no evidence in the classic sense for this. Nobody's studied it that I know and I've looked, um, but your very sense of what food is starts to swing back to plants and animals and away from boxes and bags. Because, you know, we've all grown up in this, it, where food is the thing that you get at the grocery store and it's in the, the, those boxes with the bright colors and the exciting punctuation. And, mm. and, and we just have a sense that that's what food is. Mm. So it changes your appetite. Would you, is that I fair? I think it does. And over time, it, it changes your, just your very sense of what, of what sustenance is. And, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but after a while, the boxes and the bags don't even really look like food so much anymore. And don't get me wrong, you still can't leave me alone with the bag of Doritos or the Snickers <laughs> bar in the afternoon. It will be gone. But this is just sort of a hedge against the, the excesses of our modern food system. I don't know if you've seen the, these websites that are dedicated to people who have begun to shift towards a primarily meat diet and they've solved oh. autoimmune problems, all kinds of health problems. And I don't totally know what to make of it because on one hand, it is antithetical to absolutely everything that mm -hmm. modern medicine... Nutrition, right. Right? But at the same point, I know and that... Everything your doctor will tell you. I've always had a terrible stomach. And there was one time in my entire childhood, literally terrible stomach to the degree that I would eat with my family and I would get sick afterwards, always. Mm -hmm. There was one time in my entire life where I had a meal with my family where I didn't get sick afterwards. And it was when we, were, we went to Paris one year and I was trying to show off my French skills. And so I ordered beef tartare, thinking that it was not what it was. And the waiter brought me this plate of raw meat with a raw egg on top. And he was very cute. And so I was like, there's no way that I'm turning my nose up at this. And I ate it and I felt fantastic. The only have time. That, yeah. Have you tried that experiment since? I have. I felt like last week I felt fantastic. And I still have a bad stomach, you know? Here's, here's the thing about food. Um, we really don't understand the connection between the things that we eat and health outcomes. And if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see that I have these raging arguments with people about this. In fact, just yesterday, I pissed off a whole bunch of people. <laughs> That's the point of Twitter, really, I think. That means I'm you're winning. Really fucking good at <laughs> and, and because I have, I really have it in for the nutrition science community. And I think that they have... They have walked Americans down the garden path with the idea that we can actually figure out the connections between the things that we eat and our health outcomes. And the reality is we don't have the tools to do it. We don't mm. have the tools to do it because we can't keep people captive and then kill them and autopsy their livers. We can't do it because people suck at telling us what they ate. 
Um, and so these huge databases with these gigantic cohorts are really just terribly inaccurate. And they're also hopelessly confounded because, of course, people who eat vegetables are different from people who don't eat vegetables in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, now all these people are trying uh, carnivory. And, you know, my best understanding of humans and diets is that we are astonishing, astonishingly adaptable omnivores. And humans can thrive on almost any diet except the one we have right now. <laughs> and, and if you're eating foods that, uh, you know, have their nutrients intact, I think almost any combination of them is going to be okay. And, you know, we understand the deficiency diseases and, and, you know, we know that without, uh, uh, Vitamin C, you get scurvy, but some of the people who are carnivorous don't seem to be having that problem, which is surprising and, and interesting. And I, you know, I know people, there's a, a woman who I'm Twitter acquaintances with who's been on this carnivore diet because it is the only diet that she feels good on. And so that's what she does. And I'm like, well, power to you. If you, if that is not the case, if you are comfortable eating all kinds of other foods. I think that the best bet diet wise is not to eliminate any particular category, not to eliminate meat, not to eliminate vegetables, not to eliminate grains, because the best hedge we have against uncertainty is variety and intact nutrients. And so eating a wide variety of foods with their nutrients intact is probably the best thing we can do. But that said, if foods make you feel sick and meat doesn't, hell, give it a shot. I, I would. Yeah, I did it for like a while, actually. It felt a lot better, but I got kind of sick of it, though, is the truth. Like, I, I just kind of, I was like. I could never eat an all meat diet. <laughs> yeah. Ever. I think what it actually came down to for me personally was like eating not anything other than meat tends to like be a lot of volume of food and I think that's mm -hmm. what was causing a lot of my problems it was just like I tend to only eat once a day so I was just like eating way too much stuff like meat allows you to why? eat like a little bit and then you know why do I only eat once a day I, why only eat once a day uh, I was just like trying out the intermittent fasting thing I thought there might be some health benefits I mean it does allow you to you know work longer harder without being distracted and you know like food makes you kind of tired in the head sometimes too Don't you and, get hungry not after a couple of days. Really, you don't actually. The, the man's body, basically a bird. Like if he could. <laughs> the body gets used to it. Uh, yeah, it's weird. You're like your circadian rhythms will adjust if you just do it once a day. But I think we can adjust to just about anything, and you should. That's right. Whatever you enjoy and makes you feel good, and I wish people would stop telling people either <laughs> a not to eat a particular way or b to eat a particular yeah. way. Yeah. Everybody wants everybody to be like them. That's true. And, you know, the claims for intermittent fasting and carnivory echo the claims for, you know, diets since time immemorial. If something is wrong in your life, if it's with your health or your energy level or whatever it is, if you make a big change, you tend to feel better, especially if you think the change is going to make you feel better. Mm. And so, you know, carnivory is something that's very difficult to test in in a trial, and this is again why we can't really figure out the connection between food and health, because there's no way you you, you can't blind people <laughs> to what they're eating. I mean, it's a real mess, not just in nutrition, but in the rest of observational data science. Oh, like this whole pandemic and everything was a mess. Like trying to tease out effects of this drug and that. Like we teach a immunology, we teach a COVID class at at University of Portland. Oh yeah. And it's like so, the same thing. We're trying to go through these papers with the kids and like the conclusions are so tenuous for almost everything. And ironically, like the scientists who are writing these papers kind of get it. Like they definitely like conclude with like, well, what can we really say here? You know, from these huge meta studies that, that a lot of this mm -hmm. efficacy, you know, efficacy is being discussed mm -hmm. for this therapy versus that. But uh, it's not what comes across in the news. And it's interesting how that subtlety gets kind of left on the manuscript table. And, you know, in nutrition, the, uh, uh, the scientists like to blame the journalists for, you know, not, uh, uh, not, uh, not, not dealing with the subtlety, not passing that along. But the reality is that, in fact, and this is what we were having the argument about, 
um, that I've seen time after time after time after time where people do these goddamn co- these associations between food consumption and health outcomes in these big cohorts. And they always have these mealy mouth little things. Well, it's only a correlation. So we can't really, you know, we can't say for sure that it's causal, but then they get interviewed by the media. And just today, just today, the lead author on this, another one of these godforsaken studies, um, uh, uh, it made explicit causal connections between, get this, eating half an avocado a week and having your risk of cardiovascular disease drop 20%. 20%? Now, yes. Now, really, if anybody actually believed that, we would be prescribing avocados for the entire population. We would be putting avocados in the water. <laughs> it's obviously not true but they go out from fucking harvard with a straight face and it's 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 all walter willett's fault <laughs> i mean people really believe in the in the fact that their their research is the exception right because if you if you talk to that person mm-hmm. on a different day they about a different paper and a different group then they would be absolutely willing to condemn it but when it's their work there's this exceptionalism you know it's their baby we all feel that it's it's us it's our stuff yeah and and, and you know y- you do all this research and you spend this time correlating al- you know avocado consumption <laughs> and cardiovascular disease and it's your life for 4 years and so of course you believe in this connection because you set off to to explore it in the first place but these are fucking harvard epidemiologists well, you don't get to be a Harvard epidemiologist by publishing uh, less exciting findings. And by not believing with every single fiber of your being the ideas that you have put down. And this is actually what the podcast is often about. And so I would love to have you come back and talk about talk this. About nutrition? Oh, I, I'm happy to talk about nutrition. Yeah, right, nutrition is- and science and studies and the way that science is carried out because there's so much garbage. It's so hard to teach this aspect too. So much garbage and and okay food is something that people have to make their own decisions about it's not like you know we're controlling salmonella in in industrial chicken operations this is something that people are dying for answers they want to know what should i eat Mm. and this combination of nutrition scientists in the media have given people the idea that we can figure out what these connections are. Mm. But then all the the connections keep changing. Eggs are no good, then eggs are good, then eggs yeah, are no yeah, good. Yeah. coffee's no good. Go, oh, coffee's okay. Bad. <laughs> Ooh, very bad. Maybe not so bad, maybe a little bad. Um, and and it happens over and over again. And and I think that that what has happened here is that ordinary American eaters have been completely disempowered by this. They believe that nutrition is this super sciencey endeavor when the reality is we have no fucking idea and you should eat things you like. Um, you should eat whole foods with their nutrients intact and you should keep your calories at a level that keep you at the weight you want to be. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, I absolutely agree. What do you think of lab grown meat? I think lab-grown meat is a good idea. I think it's going to be a very long time before it's it's it can scale um, to the extent and it can be cost-effective enough so that it can actually replace actual meat because, you know, meat, especially beef, is the thing that has the biggest climate impact. And, you know, people argue about this all the time and there is a school that believes well if you do this rotational grazing you can sequester more carbon than than your your cattle emit um, from enteric fermentation um but that's not really panning out in the hmm. real world um how so and well for a, a couple of ways so people are trying to do this and i know of one study done at Michigan State, Jason Roundtree and his team there, um, where 
in very specific experimental circumstances, they were able to sequester more carbon than the beef was responsible for. Um, and I know, I also know of some, some uh, places where they're doing it in Latin America, but that's done with silvopasture. So a lot of the carbon sequestration comes from trees. Hmm. And then, then you have to ask the question, okay, well, what if you planted the trees and you didn't have the cattle? Um, and there have been a couple of places that have been trying to do this commercially. One of them called White Oaks Pasture um, originally thought, they came out with an analysis that said that again, in very particular circumstances where they started with degraded land and started grazing cattle on it, that they did in fact come up with carbon neutral beef. But on re-examination by scientists, it turned out that that wasn't really the case. Now it cut the carbon impact of, of the beef, something like two thirds, but it also required a great deal more land. And that's a problem mm. too, because one of the things we have to do with our food system is grow more food on less land because expanding cropland is 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 a terrible way to to go forward um between deforestation and and tillage it's one of the biggest climate impact uh impacts that that uh that food has can you can that can any of those uh meat processes be brought to the city people like is there a way to i saw an amazing thread on twitter the other day where somebody was like look if everybody just kept 20 chickens and 10 yeah, hogs. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I had a little something to say about that. <laughs> it seems like the transport costs are like a huge part of this, and even if you want to talk about pollution and environmental impact. Transport, what do you mean the transport costs? Of well, like, food? Yeah, like, so we're getting our, where's, where's most meat coming from, from probably hundreds of miles outside of the city? Transport costs end up being a very, very small part of the impact of food, usually hmm. between 5 and 10%. Wow, that's surprising. Are, yeah, I, it surprises a lot of people because it sort of entered the public consciousness that, you know, local food is the way to go. Well, that's kind of, I just bring that up because that's one of the things people seem to be panicking about right now in our, you know, if I could bring this to the moment exactly like people they're like oh no the food's like the gas is going up so the food's going to go up and that's really uh that's actually quite reassuring to hear you say that so say more and you know it, it what makes sense is to grow food in the place where you can grow it most efficiently and then ship it to people from there because the the improvements that you get the or the the decreased impact from both scale and growing in a place where the conditions are ideal are going to way outweigh um, the difference in the transport cost. And, um, but I mean, I, I am fully supportive of local agriculture. I have a small farm here on Cape Cod. Um, I think that there are lots of other reasons to buy local food. I think it's great to be connected to the source of your food. It's great to have a place where you can bring a kid to see how a carrot comes out of the ground or what a pig looks like. Um, it's, it's, it's a community touchstone in a lot of places. I'm wildly supportive of local food, but it is not, it doesn't have a lower climate impact or environmental impact. I mean, I was reading a book, which I cannot remember off the top of my head right now, the name of it, but it was kind of talking about this, which was that when you look at the way that food is grown on these large farms, it is super technological. You know, you have these sensors that are all over the field that tell you about the conditions of the soil. You have the ability to deal with microclimates and various moments where things might not be going ideally well you're really tuning how much fertilizer you use and and how you're in agriculture they call it yeah right and so small farmers don't have that in any way shape or form and so the returns per plot of land are significantly lower than they would be if that same land was being farmed using precision agriculture well you know farming scales like everything else there are there are real benefits to to big farms, but of course there are disadvantages too. Um, and they're not inherent disadvantages. I think that the way that big farms have sort of evolved in this country um, have been, the, the problems have basically been that we're growing two crops on mm. half of our 
U.S. acreage. And a lot of them aren't even for food, right? We're growing a lot of corn for ethanol soy, growing, and uh, soy for feeding cattle, as far as I can tell. Something like 30% of the corn crop goes to ethanol, and a big part of both the corn and the soy crop go to animal feed. Um, and then there are there are problems with the way these crops are grown, and there's terrible runoff and nutrient pollution uh, in, in the waterways. Um, and there's a big loss of topsoil, and now there are water problems. There are a lot of problems associated with, with this. And, and I think people are right to be skeptical of industrial agriculture and to point to the problems of industrial agriculture. agriculture. But what we can't do is throw the baby out with the bathwater because the yields we get from industrial agriculture are the things we want to keep. The answer isn't non-industrial agriculture. It's better industrial agriculture. Mm. And it seems like there's an aspect of people getting to know what this food is and where it comes from. And that's what I'm curious if you imagine how that can be transferred to the city. Like, how can you become better in touch with what meat is if you live in the city? Is there is there... You know, that seems like a really tough one. You can grow tomato plants maybe on your balcony or something, but, how, you know, are there ways that these processes can become more real to people? Because most people live in the city, it seems like. I think it's, I think it's, it's difficult. And, you know, the way to do it when we lived in New York, you know, we went down to the Union Street, uh, Union Square Green Market, and there were some local producers and we could buy from them, but that's about as close as you're going to come to an you know the source of an of animal food um so yeah it's definitely harder if you live in a city but even if you live outside a city i think a lot of people are going to be unwilling to actually kill animals for meat either for ethical reasons or because most people don't relish the idea of having to do that yourself mm. and you know i actually think that everyone who eats, everyone who eats meat should kill something. For sure. Because it it is, okay, so can I tell you about my turkeys? Yeah, yeah please. Because yeah. that was the first thing I, this was the first thing I killed. And so it, when we got here and we started this challenge, we wanted to eat one food a day that we, we hunt or grow or gather. Um, and we start with a garden. And then once you do a garden, it's like, okay, yeah, I, I think we can build a chicken coop. And once you do that, I think I can identify mushrooms that won't kill me. And then we decided to take the leap to livestock. And we got this flock of turkeys. And it was, it, it was basically an impulse buy. We were at the feed store. <laughs> and so you know how like at the grocery store, they put the Snickers bar and People magazine right at the checkout. So like in your cart, you have like the green beans and the economist. And like you've got this last chance to be undone. The feed store does the same thing. They know chicks are really cute and they put them in brooders right in front of the store. And Kevin and I, my husband and I had talked about turkeys and there we were and there they were. And so we just said, what the hell? I mean, we didn't have any idea about how to raise turkeys, but you know, probably the theme of 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 the book is what the hell? <laughs> Take a flyer. <laughs> and so we took these little birds home and we figured we had a little time while they were still small. Well, we could figure this all out. <laughs> so we learned as we went along. We we tried to do housing for them and that was a work in progress and 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 but we did, we raised them and, and they were happy and healthy birds. And we knew that, you know, the Sunday before Thanksgiving was, was doomsday for them. And I was extremely apprehensive about it because I had never killed an animal. And I was so committed to trying to make sure I did this in the best way possible, that I didn't fuck it up. I mean, if it, in the food world, there are lots of things you can fuck up and nothing bad happens, you know, <laughs> but, but if you're killing an animal, you got to do it right. Because then you'll just waste um, it otherwise, right? And you'll cause suffering to the animal. Yeah. And, and so we wanted to kill these birds um, 
it, and this is something people probably all used to be acquainted with too or or absolutely yeah. see this is part of the whole thing that i wrote this whole book about doing all this stuff that like any 10 year old could have done <laughs> right there's like there's no way there you that you would have been eating meat 100 years ago and not have killed something by the time right. you're five, ten years old. Well, there were city, you know, city dwellers for whom that w- that was probably true then, and certainly true then. A, a rare right. few, yeah, but it's on the right. Ri- I mean, everybody lives in the city now. I don't think that was always. Eighty-three percent of the U.S. population lives in the city at this point. But it was only like sixty oh, percent. It, that high. It was only sixty percent oh. in 1950, though. So it's like, phew, it's like. I think you you really have to go back to pre-industrial revolution to really find where everybody was getting their own food. But um, but still, people were way closer to it more recently, and so you know we researched how to do this and and discovered like lots of people have done this and YouTube is your friend, you know, (laughs) and, and lots of other people have been exactly where we were trying to figure out how to do this properly. And, um, and it turns out that uh, the best way to kill poultry is to have a cone and put them in upside down. So the head comes out the narrow end and the bottom. And then you, you cut the throat one cut and you do not cut the the esophagus of the trachea you're just cutting the blood vessels and the only pain involved for the animal is the one cut and it happens real quick and they bleed out and bleeding out you know as far as i can tell and i have talked to people about it is a fairly low stress way to die and of course they don't know they're dying Hmm. so they don't know that their life is being taken from them so you know for humans we think, you know, dying is, is well, we know dying is a terrible thing. It's the end of your life. But the animal doesn't understand that. It just understands it's been put in, in a cone and, uh, and had that one cut. And now it's feeling a little dizzy as the blood drains out. And so... That's kind of the quintessential human crisis, as I can, as far as I can tell, is that we have this knowledge that it's all going to end. Like all of our hard work and everything is just building up to this, like really boring, like lack of anything. I know, and you think about it, and like I occasionally go to estate sales, and you see these homes that have been put together by people who have cared about every object, and then you know they die, and it's like a hundred photographs for a dollar. Hunters invade. (laughs) (laughs) It's all over. And yeah, no, it is. And but that that makes it all the more important. I think that like what you're saying, I think that is that does that is like a big reason to do this in the first place is because like ex- like holding death and being so close to death like that just seems like one of the most important lessons. Like it's so bizarre to me how we like you never see death in the world we live in right now. This seems like a real good opportunity to rehearse those emotions and so forth. I mean, as soon as someone dies in the world, it's like they get rid of the body, get rid of the body. Like we don't have uh, open casket funerals like we used to just everything. It's just, it's almost like we don't want to look at it. Like if we don't think about death, maybe we won't have to worry about it or something. We certainly don't want to think about it when it comes to animals. And of course, every time I write about this or tweet about this, um, I do get some very angry responses because I do kill animals to eat them. Um, And so, all right, go back to the turkeys and then we'll go back to that. So, so we did this research, we figured out how to do it. Kevin made a cone out of this piece of sheet metal, the cone of silence. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I, we do joke about it, but we also take it very seriously. And I sharpened the knife to within an inch of its life. And, uh, and we slaughtered those turkeys and we did it well. Mm. And it went according to plan. And since we have, we have killed many animals and it does not always go according to plan. Sometimes despite your best efforts, you screw up or something happens and the animal suffers more than you would like it to. Um, and that's, that is part of this and it's, it's a gut wrenching part of it. But the thing about it is that human existence is an animal killing enterprise. Mm. And, you know, if you are vegan, you don't have the evidence on the dinner table, but all, you know, the rats that have been poisoned to keep them out of the grain stores and, you know, the rabbits that get uh, swallowed up by the combines are, are just as dead. 
And and the plants are just as dead too. I, yeah, I think that yeah, we have this true. moral evaluation where we look at the the things that are cute and fuzzy and and reflect us, and and we place them at a higher level than plants. But I don't really see a reason to do that. And I know that that's kind of an extreme position, but I really that don't. An extreme position. I do not share it. <laughs> I I like. We I, see like self similarity with animals. We're like, oh, they have two eyes. We, we do, but, but everything's I, alive. I mean, I think that's your point. It's like, it, even the bacteria in the soil are alive. I literally think that the plants have an awareness that we have not fully grokked because science doesn't spend money on figuring out if heads of lettuce can talk to each other. But I guarantee there, there you... There is accumulating evidence that they do talk to each other, right? Yeah, there's a woman named Monica trees, Gagliano. Certainly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? And so I, I think that there is evidence that a hundred years from now we'll look back and we'll realize just how little we understood about the way that these beings were as sentient and as aware as as the mouse or the rabbit. We just don't have I that relationship. Take with them. that bet. Okay. <laughs> but we'll both be dead. So there's no way we would ever. Because I think that chemical signaling is different from sentience. And uh and I do think that plants are different from animals. Um, but animals that we raise for meat um that are part of uh our Part of the way that we have fed ourselves for a long time, you know, since since we emerged, um, hopefully don't get wasted. Mm. So uh, killing for no reason is obviously something that we shouldn't do. But if we don't eat animals, we have to eat something else. And everything that we do has far reaching impact um on our landscape and you know so it's always it's always the rats that get me hmm. because everybody's like when i i've talked about killing pigs and people hate that idea that here's this this charming obviously sentient they've all seen babe animal. you know right they've all seen babe and um and people are very upset about killing the pig but the pig is uh wouldn't have a life if we didn't give it to them and if its death goes as planned it does not see it coming it's you know uh, a, a bullet through through the brain and it's all over preferably over a favorite treat um but the rats that we poison to keep them out of the subways to keep them out of our houses, to keep them out of the grain stores, are just as smart as the pig. And they're even cute and furry. But nobody gives a flying fuck about the rats. And so this isn't really about the calculus of animal suffering. It's about a visceral response to the killing of an animal you find appealing. And I think the calculus of animal suffering is difficult. Um, and I, you know, we don't have all the information to figure out what diet will, you know, optimally kill or have the fewest animals suffer. And I would argue that a pastured pig that uh, eats grass and other plants, possibly supplemented with, I, I know somebody who grows them in Vermont and supplements them with, with whey from a, a cheese factory. Here's an animal that isn't eating the food that's harvested with the combines. It has a good life for six months and it dies with one bullet. Um, I think it's hard to find uh, a, a meal where there's less suffering involved than that. And that animal is a big animal and it feeds a lot of people. Um, I think what most and, people are afraid of is they're not all living those nice lives, right? Like in these factory no, farms, right? And I have huge problems with that, which is why I don't eat conventional pork. Um, I'm very careful about where I source my meat from if I don't grow it myself. And I completely sign on to the objections to, to the animal welfare issues with the industrialized food system. It's one of the very serious problems we have. How long did it take to grow a pig, by the way? 
they one of the one of the reasons pigs are are way more environmentally and climate friendly than cattle is that they grow very fast mm. and they're very fertile. So a pig will grow to slaughter weight in about six months. Wow. And you I think I'm getting a pig? 50 pounds. Wow, we should maybe grow a pig. I mean, I've been... Pigs are easy. And they're... But just make sure you have your exit strategy. You know how they're going to be slaughtered. Because if you take them, if you want to take them to a slaughterhouse, you generally have to make that appointment very far ahead of time. Right. And do you, do you slaughter your own pig? Is that correct? You said about the... You, the you mentioned... The, can you fire a gun in your backyard or how does that work uh we had to get special dispensation because huh. yeah because yeah, i mean for most people living in cities it, it's probably we're possible like, right here. we're technically in a city but we're not really i mean i, I yeah, think no, that we, oh go ahead so the, the firearm issue is a is a whole different one we had to get permission from our neighbors we warned them that we were going to do this and i see i see okay so. my yeah so that was my big that's one of the things that's holding us back with the livestock and everything like that even chickens is like oh geez we're not gonna be able to go we have family all over the coast and like, ah, oh, we won't be able to go on tri trips. And it's, uh, what, how do you work that out? Is it, is it a prohibitive? Or? No, it's actually not. Okay. And, you know, we, we hooked up, uh, a, uh, uh, a feeder that was good for five or six days and a waterer that was good for longer than that. And, you know, we, we didn't leave without having somebody, just check in on them, but there was no real work to be done. They just had to go down and, and uh, uh, you know, make sure nothing bad had happened. And they only got out once. <laughs> <laughs> same, same deal with the chickens too. You put them on like automatic chickens. Feed, yeah. Or? Chickens are easy. Um, right now we have, uh, well, Kevin has, my husband is, has, that we have a big giant water and a big giant feeder so that w we could leave we could leave for a week and all we need is somebody to collect the eggs and mm. we have people who who have no problem doing that how long so. do your chickens how long is the cycle like do you how long do you keep a chicken for before i assume you eat them uh, when you're when they're done with their egg laying duties uh, we, we have but we generally don't mm. because we have a friend who really likes you know dishes with made with old hens and you know these have been our chickens and i have to say it, it and it's a fair amount of work to to slaughter them and and process them um so they they go to uncle adelson <laughs> and we, somebody uh, eats them. I, like is this like coco vin that he's making or like what do you mean yeah. Yeah, I no, see. he's uh he's brazilian so I see. Uh, so it's it's probably some brazilian version of chicken stew and uh uh, yeah, so they'll lay hard for a couple of years, um, and it depends on, you know, what your objective is. We'll we'll probably keep them for three seasons, uh, and then completely reflock. And we used to try and integrate new chickens into the old chickens, but they they're just they're little dinosaurs, and they just they just go at each other. There's war in the coop, and we can't stand that. So, and also if you actually take the whole flock out. Um, and you let the coop be dormant for a little while. Um, it's good for you know any kind of parasites or pests or things that are in mm. there. They'll die over the winter, and then you can have a new flock in fresh. And mm. so, we'll reflock every few years. Was it hard to learn all of this stuff? Because from the outside, it seems very daunting. Like, let's say that yeah, you have a yard. You're in the you're. We're not talking about somebody who lives in the inner city, and they're not really capable of of doing this because apartments or, or whatever else, or they're limited to a community garden. But let's say you're in the burbs and you have a yard, but mm -hmm. the even if you plant something, it just seems like a really daunting process of going from, I have planted something to I am keeping animals to I am now slaughtering the animals. What's that curve? What does that curve look like? Well, that curve looks like you becoming a better, more competent person. Mm. And that's what this was all about. So, yeah, we started with a garden in whiskey barrels on the roof in Manhattan. And, uh, and you know, when those little tomatoes, you know, those little sweet cherry tomatoes. Yeah, like, the early girls. Ah. 
See, right, and they're the they're the best tomatoes the world has ever seen. The tomatoes you grow yourself, and and so we we came to Cape Cod. We had a bigger garden, and then we started thinking, well, what's the next thing? And if you had told me out of the gate that okay, well, you're going to shoot, field dress, and break down a deer, I would have not believed you. And and it is this this gradual, um, not just acquisition of skills. But you internalize the idea that this isn't rocket science, and people have been doing it since there've been people. And if they can do it, well, you probably can too. And it seems daunting to us because we have gotten so far removed from the source of our food. Um, and but it's really, it's not that hard. And I uh, and you just you try one thing. And that gives you a little bit more confidence and you try the next thing and, 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 or not, you know, if it doesn't speak to you, then don't continue, but you don't have to look at it as this huge commitment or this, you know, a lifestyle U-turn. It can just be a window box. And, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I mean, you, you've spoken about this, the, the fact that this isn't really about opting out where. No, absolutely not. But do you think that it is, do, so do you think that it's not about opting out because it's a bad idea to opt out or because it's impossible to opt out? Um, that's a really good question. And mostly I think it's impossible to opt out. And I'm kind of with you, you know, on that. I, I consider myself to be sort of the world's leading expert on the amount of food that two people can grow at home. <laughs> and, and the year I kept track and I kept track more or less, you know, back of the envelope, sort of keeping track uh, uh, quite a bit. And the year that I really paid a lot of attention to it and we tried to get as much of our food firsthand as we could, we ended up getting around 30% of our calories from food that we did ourselves. And almost none of it was plants. It mm. was eggs. It was fish where we, we live in a place where you can catch a lot of fish and we got good at catching fish. I think that was a year we did the pigs. Um, we also had a successful, one of our very few successful uh, uh, bee colonies. So we mm. had honey. Um, and those calories add up. Kale, not so much. And the things that are sort of the staples of 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 the backbone of the human diet, um, whole grains, legumes, tubers. Mostly, you don't want to grow those yourself, although there are some exceptions. You can grow, grow some beans. You can certainly grow potatoes and sweet potatoes. Um, if you're in it for subsistence, then those that's where you have to put your gardening energy. Um, but, you know, it's not that it's impossible to opt out, um, but it's... You, you certainly have better quit your day job. Uh, it's it's a great deal of work. It's a very uncertain enterprise, but people certainly can do it. I don't want to do it. Mm. I am a huge fan of interdependence. Mm. I do not want to wall myself off from my fellow man. And we found that when we did this whole project, it, it was the opposite of walling ourselves off it connected us to our community and we spent time with the other people who were growing things and, and keeping chickens and, and hunting. And, and sometimes it gave us common ground with people that we wouldn't have had other common ground with. Um, and, and that was one of the great things about it. And it, it you know, it, it's like, I know it's, it's like, so all creatures great and small, <laughs> but, but there is this coalescing in a community around these activities, because I think they are fundamental and they are universal. It's interesting that you say that there's this, the, the difference between the walling off and the connecting, because when we, when we were first in Portland, I, I was trying to sell a story on preppers because we ran across a bunch of preppers mm -hmm. and there's one lady who she was actually was right at the beginning of the pandemic. It was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And there was one lady and I actually ended up talking to her dad for a long time who had grown up and her dad was a hardcore prepper 
And she herself had, she was prepper adjacent, so to speak, Mm -hmm. but had disavowed the lifestyle because she pointed to the fact that there was something about the prepping lifestyle that made you completely disconnect with everybody else because it was this mentality of, this is mine. If I bring anybody else in, then they will be a mouth to feed and they will be a liability. And so there is this tendency to go as far away as possible and to disconnect wholly. And that was kind of contradictory to me because I imagined communities of preppers prepping together as it being this, you know, prepper enterprise of, because there's Facebook groups and everything else, but it turned out that it was very, very solitary. And it just, it made me really skeptical of the viability of the enterprise and opting out is kind of like that where we were actually, we were listening to, to Econ Talk last night and Michael Munger was on it and he was talking about, and I saw that you were on it too, which was, it was a great conversation. Yeah, I've been on it twice now. I love Russ Roberts. Yeah, he's great. Um, but uh, Munger was talking about this idea of building a new constitution and his point was that, uh, look, if you think that you can do better than what's already been done, you're crazy. Because this is a system that has been developed for a long time with a lot of people working on it to really try to make it work. And if you raise this to the ground and you try to start from scratch, you're going to end up with something worse. Because, or, or it's going to take you as much time to get to this exact same place as it already took you. And, you know, when I think about the scenarios that preppers are prepping for, um, I'm like, can't go there. I mean, we have a lot of food here. We have guns here. But come Armageddon, I'm going down with the ship. <laughs> <laughs> I have no interest in defending my food with my guns and, you know, trying to ensure my survival and picking off my neighbors. <laughs> I can't go there. It, it seems hopeless, too. Like, whoever has the biggest guns is going to win. Like, there's no way you can defend. And you know who you has know? the biggest guns? army has to exactly right yeah <laughs> yeah it's quite interesting. right it's like plus yeah you might have like six months worth of food but like it'll probably be like you know everybody yeah then, everybody, what? Yeah, then what right i always but, imagine that these are people who read the road and thought that it was an aspirational manual as opposed to something to fear <laughs> and, but, but i don't want to diss that because i know it makes some people feel secure and um I, it's just not a mindset I share. I mean, you should be I, probably be prepared for like that, you know, like a bad storm or you know, it's not outage, right. Yeah. Power outage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like have some water on hand or something, right? Um, but I, I love the interconnected idea. I think that's more realistic, and that's the way that humans have done it since the beginning of time. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the way I want to do it. And I, you know, I think that we've all spent so much time with our screens and, you know, bowling alone. I don't know if you read that book. And 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 here's this great way to go outside, get some exercise, reconnect with the food that humans thrive on and meet some of your neighbors. I mean, what's the downside? Mhm. Yeah. I mean, I always, you know, I'll I'll go to the gym and I'm at the gym and I'm thinking about it and I always feel like I should be at home digging in the garden or doing something physical because it seems like this pinnacle of wasted effort to go to the gym to maintain my body, but to maintain it in a way where I'm just, I'm moving weights from place to place and accomplishing nothing. And it's... It is... I, I totally get that. And uh, oyster farming, which we've done for a long time, is nothing but heavy lifting. Farming mm. oysters, like farming rocks. You're just <laughs> moving heavy shit around. And, and we, one of the reasons we did it is because it, it has kept us fit. And I do do the weights. And I do, I hike miles and miles and miles in our local conservation area walking just to get exercise. But in the summer when we have the garden to do and, you know, we do a lot of fishing and we have to prepare the boat and and doing that kind of work. My husband feels it even more strongly than, than I do. He hates exercise for exercise's sake, but he'll stay out all day doing hard work in service of, of some goal. And I think that a world where people kind of thought about these ways to take their leisure time and to direct them towards things that were 
I don't want to say necessarily productive, but fulfilling. Because I think that too often it's really easy to pick up your phone and to just doom scroll or to to eat the to eat the equivalent of Fritos, right? It's and I love Fritos, but it seems like it seems like there's like a Jordan Petersonian aspect to all of this too, where it's like you're making yourself better, right? Like you're you know you're yes. taking care of your yes. you might be doing this sort of insignificant task like cleaning your room or something, but if you can instill the joy that that brings in you from such a, a small thing. And then you realize, oh, I've become stronger in the process. It's kind of a win-win situation. So did you probably didn't. I'm going to guess this wasn't on your reading list. But did you happen to read the book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up? I have not read it, but I have had a lot of friends that have read it and they've talked about it. And you and everybody knows of it because it was an international phenomenon. And I picked it up because I was curious about what all the fuss was about. I don't happen to have a stuff problem. I got plenty of other problems, but not that one. I think I sent it to my mom, actually. I was like, Mom, yeah, I think this might be good. <laughs> and But the thing that got me about it, okay, she's got this whole, you know, method where you, you know, roll up your socks and... Wait, is it, isn't like the key of the method to consider each object and to ask if it brings you joy? Yes, that is that is the method. And so, but what got me was that Marie Kondo said that, you know, she, she consults with clients and after her clients go through her method and they have their house in order, literally and figuratively, um, they go on to ask for the promotion or get the overdue divorce or lose the last 10 pounds or whatever it is. And I'm thinking, what, because their house is neat? But that's not why it is. They were able to do it because they solved a problem that was in their purview to solve. And solving a problem, especially if it's a problem that's oppressive, like you know your house, um, builds strength. And confidence. And every time you solve a problem successfully, you position yourself to solve the next one. And it doesn't have to be food related, but food is just this great opportunity that you can do with no outside intervention. And and especially for those of us, I'm pushing 60, for those of us who are on the downside of our physical powers, Aging brains, brains in general, thrive on solving new problems, but our lives tend to throw the same old damn problems at us over and over again. So, so you know, trying to change how you look at food, trying to get some food firsthand, planting a garden, building a chicken coop, this is a series of new problems to solve, and solving them builds you up. It makes you better, and I think People want to eat better, and I think people want to be better. And every now and then, somebody wants to make a chicken plucker out of a washing machine. And my book is about all of those things. That's amazing. I mean, I, I, I think that it's a really valuable perspective on the world. I think of it in terms of even the act of nurturing which is kind of absent from our world. Birth rates are falling. Fewer people have kids. Fewer people have the time and space and lifestyle. But I think that there is something that comes from nurturing an organism and watching it grow and blossom and change mm -hmm. and shift and being the one that has, that has facilitated that. I've gotten into houseplants lately, and it's the first time in my life where I've actually not killed them. One even flowered. It's incredible. Mazel tov. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> But yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty psyched to get out there. I'm about to like go out in my yard now and get It's going to start work. building the chicken coop. Yeah. Well, you have to get the book. That's true, to build to grow. We'll find out how to do everything. You have to get the book. All right. Folks, so, check it out. I if if it doesn't make you laugh out loud at least once, I will buy you a beer. <laughs> That's my <laughs> standing offer. <laughs> Well, right. hopefully we can buy you a beer one day in person. I hope goods. that our paths cross in person. It has been fascinating It'll be really wonderful. talking to you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. I really appreciate it. <laughs>